incorrect when you think that science has inherent ethical guidelines. Honesty, it. Science, full as you have said, transparency. You've said many times, science describes how the world is. It doesn't tell how the world ought to be. Yes, I'm sorry. In order I, I to have you. that moral ought, you, it tells you, you have to have something that is and extra scientific. You'll come to results which are in disagreement with empirical evidence, and you'll make bad policy. That is ethics. Okay, Lawrence, one of, the, one of the standing rules within the history of philosophy, especially over the last 300 years, has been that an is does not necessitate an ought. Yeah, but you I can't, well, no, okay, okay, I understand that you might not agree, but you did make a very, very strong claim before in the course of your presentation that there is, in fact, a morality that is founded on science itself. Uh, Dr. Craig has said that science, that, that's actually part of the limits of science. You obviously disagree with that. I wonder if you could begin making, if okay. you like, the, not, not so much the moral case for science, mm -hmm. But why science has a morality inherent well, to it? I would say morality is impossible without science. That's the point. I would say science has a natural morality to it because if we want our species to stay here on this earth and reproduce, procreate, all that stuff, and and continue on and survive, you know, survival of the fittest as a conscious being with free will and all of that uh, collectively together we're going to need morality for our species to survive to have the most of our people continue and benefit and succeed let's see what he says i wonder if you could begin making if okay. you like the, not, not so much the moral case for science mm -hmm. but why science has a morality inherent well, to it i would say morality is impossible without science that's the point because and, and religion is an example, and I can't, as I say, I can't think of a more immoral document than the Old Testament. But, but the, the point is, if you don't know the consequences of your actions, then you can't even decide what's right and wrong. And so, to, to, to take, to make the, and so we have seen people's morality, if you want to call it morality, change. Slavery might have been okay because you might have believed that certain groups were inferior or not human. Science has told us that's wrong. You might have believed, as almost all religions do, that women are chattel. Science has told us that's wrong. You might have believed that homosexuality is evil. But science has told us that all mammalian species have homosexuality. That's, there's nothing in unnatural or evil about it. So to, to have a morality without science is empty. But also the way in which religion, theology in particular, has changed its mind about the nature of the universe. How do you make sense of that? I mean, how can you mm -hmm. retain a kind of consistent faith knowing that the development of your own tradition has itself gone through quite significant development? Because I believe in the objectivity of moral values and duties, I believe that moral growth and development is possible. When we say that slavery used to be widely accepted and now no longer is, I can say that's not merely a moral change, that's a moral improvement. When we say that the way we treat women is different than it used to be, that's not merely morally different, it's a moral improvement. And that kind of value judgment requires some sort of absolute standard against which these differing uh, moral uh, beliefs can be measured. Otherwise, all you can say is that there has been moral change, but not moral development. And so I would say that certainly we can develop morally. And the moral improvement is because we have become because rationality, based on empirical evidence, based on the clear empirical fact that women are not inferior and gays are not bad, that moral improvement has occurred because, because of empirical evidence. And we, as I say, the reason, the reason morality was, was, less, was needed to be improved is because we were more ignorant, and science has made us less ignorant. Those, those statements all presuppose the intrinsic worth of human beings. And that is something that can't be justified scientifically. You can show that human beings are equal in intelligence and abilities and so forth, uh, rather than racially inferior or something. But to affirm the intrinsic value of human beings, of homo sapiens, is a moral judgment that is something that's incapable of what being do you, What do you mean by intrinsic worth? What do I mean? Yeah. I mean that they're ends in themselves rather than means to ends. We treat persons as ends in themselves rather than as means to be used towards some end. And in that sense, they have intrinsic moral value and therefore need to be treated as such. And that's not a judgment that science can establish. Science tells I, I how think, the world I think science is, say, not how science it ought can, to no, be. Look, look, no, I think that's, you know, I understand it. But science can say people are conscious beings that experience pain and suffering. And, and from having experienced those things, it's unpleasant. Yeah. And in fact, by trying to minimize that, 
we make it more pleasant for ourselves and others, and that's nothing to do with God or anything else. Okay, now that's a very different ethic, Dr. Krauss. There's no, a self-interest ethic. That's what I mean ethic. by intrinsic that's, worth. That, that's, a, that's totally different than the consequentialism and utilitarianism. Well, we, we, also talk about, we also talk about the question, the question of rights, which, again, is not a question of theology, but a question of... I don't know how you can say that's self-interest ethics and not say that religion is a self-interested ethic. Because a lot of the times it feels like the whole drive of these morals is out of self-interest. It's out of eternal life, out of going to heaven and going into the great kingdom and living eternally. That is a self-interested ethic. More than understanding, essentially empathy, more than having empathy and sympathy and understanding pain and suffering and hurt, fear, and therefore not willing to apply that to others or do that to others. I don't think that's a self-interested ethic, but I do think that if your moral drive in life is the self-interest of going to heaven and having an eternal life, I don't even think I can say that you are moral, that you understand what morals are. Somebody who wants to act morally without any reward for it I think that is a true understanding of morals and empathy and community. ...of law. If people, who, who has the right to determine whether someone should live or die? You'd say it's God. You'd say God said the Canaanites should die. I mean, I'm going back to it because I find what you said so morally reprehensible that it sickens me. Well, you have to look at the historical context. Now, now, you folks who are applauding on that, I wonder, have you read the narratives? Have you read the historical context of what that's about? I read what you said. Do you yeah. disagree with anything you said? Yes, but you have to look at the historical context. I said a lot more than that. What I pointed out the was... Children deserve to, are okay to be killed because it, they're going to have eternal salvation. No, that's well, a that's misrepresentation what you said. of what I said, Dr. Well, let's, you want to go back and, repeat, and, and read it? I would like to explain it. Okay. Um, what I said there is that God pronounced judgment upon these nation states that were, were inhabiting Canaan. He had waited 400 years to bring judgment upon them. By the time he did so, these cultures were incredibly evil, incredibly reprobate. And God brought judgment upon them by destroying them as nation states. That is to say, the command to the Israeli armies was to drive these Canaanite tribes out of the land. They were being divested of the land. That's what's important to these Middle Eastern peoples, and still is today. It's the yeah, land. Absolutely, and you would say, in fact, Osama bin Laden would say the United States and Australia are morally reprehensible, and we have to destroy them. What's wrong with him saying that? Because... But that's the exact point I brought up in my debate with Rachel Wilson, trying to define what's right and wrong through the lens of religion is impossible. One religion believes their lens is morally right. Another religion believes their lens is morally right. And it's based on these ancient commands from God and scripture, which is <laughs> halfly written anonymously. Whereas collectively as a human species, we can understand pain, love, happiness, fear, anger, stealing, murder, cheating, lying, just through a conscious experience and having free will and empathy and understanding and communication like high advances of communication and stuff compared to other life on this planet. We can understand morals. We can come to a conclusion of what is morally right and wrong. But putting something so definitive like scripture or religious rules, that makes it much harder to um, collectively have an understanding when you have such precise disagreements and different desires of outcome. If you keep it simple and you keep religion out of it, we could say the majority of people just want to have a healthy, long, successful, however they define it, life, right? But when we add religion into that, that starts separating and dividing what all those things mean, and we can't all agree. We live no, 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 because no, see, we live is, in a world where we realize those is, kind of divine proclamations are nonsense and irrational. No, well, but it's not. See, I've given I've given a moral theory that you didn't explain that explains how this is consistent with an all-loving, all-just God. All-loving? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> yes, but we didn't what, love the Canaanites. And the point is that God brought, God brought judgment upon those adults by destroying these nation-states and driving them out of the land and giving the land to Israel. 
Now, the difficult part of this is the command uh, that those who remain behind to fight and to, to resist, to refuse to flee, were to be exterminating, even the children. Yeah. And my point there is that God is the author and giver of life, has the right to take and give life as he sees fit. He is not obligated to prolong my existence Who for one second Who determines what God more. has decided? No, wait, let, let me finish. God has the right to give and take life as he sees fit. In fact, all of us will die someday, and some children die in, in infancy earlier than others. God had the right to take the lives of those children if he so willed. But God didn't. The Israelites did. Right. He, he, that, that's, that's, that's a very good point. He used Israel as an instrument. How do you know? Pardon me? How do you know he used I, I, the well, How do you know they weren't just an imperialistic power who wanted to have oh, the land because it was better oh, for growing things? But, but if you say that, then there's no objection to divine command morality. The whole point here is that you're, you're saying that there's some sort of inconsistency in affirming that God is all just and all loving, and yet he issued these commands. If you don't think he issued the commands, if you think these are just legends or, or fables, then there's no problem. The, the whole problem only arises if you think that there's God not, there, there, now, There's a problem for the let, Canaanites. Let me, wait, okay. I, I haven't got to my critical point okay, here okay, yet, though. Okay. And that is, God has the right to give and take life as he sees fit. He can take a child's life now if he wants. Rather, How is there no problem? People were being murdered in the name of God commanded them to kill those people or destroyed those people and take their land. That's the problem because God told them to. Rather than letting that child live longer. What he did in this case was he took the lives of these children via the instrument of his judgment, namely Israel. Now the question is... And how fucked up is that? How is it less fucked up to say nature is unfair, it's a balance of order and chaos, and sometimes it's unfair and it takes its course? Some children are born with illnesses, some people have just unfortunate you know, occurrences and their lives are taken away from them early. How is that less unfair than saying God chose that child or that person, that God willed that to that child or, or to that person rather than nature took its course and it's unfair and, and there's an actual scientific reason behind it, not some all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty God that literally chose that for them. Is Did he wrong those children in doing that? That's the issue. Did he do something wrong to those children in some way? And my point is, no, he did not, because those children went to an eternity of incomprehensible joy and eternal life in the presence of a loving God. Uh, well, so just that, like... This is like when Lori Vallow said she didn't do anything wrong when killing her own children because they're in a better place with God now. That's the kind of fucked up insanity type shit you get with this. People say my world without God is going to have some weird funky morals because two men can get married. <laughs> but then they'll say shit like this. What I would say is that you are right, Scott. Consequentialism is a terrible ethic. If... Uh, on consequentialism, raping and killing a little girl would somehow bring about, through some fortuitous uh, impact, the greatest amount of good for the greatest number of people, not only would that action be morally justified, you would be morally obligated to do it, which is horrible. It's morally reprehensible. So what we need is an ethic that has certain objective moral principles that are not dependent simply on consequences but I would say are rooted in God, who is a transcendent anchor point for moral values beyond culture. But it doesn't, and it never would. And people say this all the time too, right? If we say, thou shall not kill is the sixth commandment of the Ten Commandments in Christianity. Well, if you were to kill one person who was about to kill 10 other innocent people, then the right thing to do by the standards of consequentialism would be to kill the one person who's going to kill 10 innocent people for no reason. But if you just go by God's standards, thou shall not kill, right? Or are there exceptions? Or is consequentialism taken into account in Christianity? If so, I would say that religion needs consequentialism to make these things precise to get morals down to a precision you couldn't have those moral standards in religion without consequentialism i'm, I'm going to uh, send this one to uh, to professor kraus first uh you said that transparency reliance on evidence peer review and testability 
those are the virtues that define among science, the virtues right? of, among the virtues that define science among yeah. the virtues of science if no room for faith remains then what about things like art and love as well now can i just say i mean just hovering on the top of, of that uh you richard dawkins sam harris others have been criticized not just by religious folk but also by philosophers people who are interested in art and aesthetics uh that science has tried to fill too much of the field and tried to explain a little bit too much. I understand that you disdain that, but I'm yeah. just wondering if you could sort of explain maybe a bit why. Well, that's an ignorant statement, but... Um, well, the, why? 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 Yeah, I'll explain it. I'm not saying you're ignorant. I, uh, 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 the statement is. And, and the, the point is that I, what my science is a human cultural activity. And in fact, if you read my writing, you'll see that I say the worth of science, in my opinion, is not from the technology. Well, we tend to love its technology, which has made the world a happier, healthier place for most people. But it's the fact that like art and music and literature, it forces us to reassess our place in the cosmos. It, it, it opens our eyes to the world. And art and music and literature do that. It, they do. It's by exploring. Art does it in a way of exploring our expression, our understanding of our humanity, visually expressing our, our consciousness, our, our feelings, things that we can't see. We visually express them through music and art. It's experimentation. And science is just an explanation. It's, it's a process that explains reality. It's similar. It's a process that can explain the other functions of the universe that we can't see with our own naked eye. So art is a bit more nuanced, it's a bit more <laughs> creative, artistic, because it has to do with personal identity and experience, and science has to do with more of a concrete experience, a collective understanding and experience of the natural world around us. Art is a personal and individual expression of the experience that certain people may relate to. Certain people might have a taste for a certain type of art or a taste for a different type of art. It's much more nuanced and varied, all while being true and real though. But science defines the full collective experience of everyone's reality. But so does science. And there's no sense in which science reduces the value of art, music, and literature. As, 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 and in fact, the most famous example I know of in that regard is from Richard Feynman, I wrote a book about, who said that a rainbow isn't any less beautiful because you understand how it's caused, it's much more beautiful. When you understand the amazing things that are happening, in fact, it's much more exciting. So I think a lot of people think science kills God in a way, by explaining it. I think you can believe in a god and also fully believe in science, too. It's these ancient texts that seem to contradict it more so. And they have no flexibility to change or progress, improve. Although William Lane Craig said that he believes morals can improve, I guess, as, as humans evolve and such, which doesn't really make sense to me but um maybe it's our understanding of it i don't know i'm not going to interpret his understanding for you for myself so i feel like lots of people think because science explains life it, it kills the beauty or the wonder behind it and i just don't think that's true at all i think the true beauty of life is understanding it it's wanting to know more about the mystery not not just the mystery but the drive and will to understand it and learn and realize what the natural experience of life is and such. It's a part of God in a way, in the way that I believe it. We have evolved to these conscious beings where we are starting to comprehend ourselves, that the, we are the universe, we are built out of the universe. It's evolved to have a consciousness which it's now experiencing and understanding and comprehending itself ourselves we are comprehending from which we've come from and i think that's one of the drives of survival of the fittest and evolution is life wanting to grow to a point of full comprehension and full understanding and this is just my own personal opinion of what kind of the meaning of life is and maybe there's a greater purpose behind that but 
that's where I am currently today with it. That's why I think nature is so beautiful and life is so beautiful because it's just this perfect balance of order and chaos coming together to create all of this. Like, it's pretty amazing. I don't know. But yeah, the whole point is that science giving an explanation, giving us answers to these mysteries does not kill the beauty of life or anything like that. I think that is the beauty of life is learning and knowledge and growth, progression, evolution. Uh, Professor Craig, there's a question here um, about essentially how can you be so sure about the will of God? You're speaking quite forthrightly, yes. especially about the question of Canaanite children. That's what yes. this question is pivoting to. How can you be so sure about the will of God? And, and again, if I can just sort of throw something that seems to be hovering above this question, I mean, this is also touching upon a very deep theological debate is something right because God wills it, or does God will it because it is in itself right? Right, that's the old Euthyphro dilemma, and I think it's a false dilemma. I think the correct uh, position is that God wills something because he is good, so that the good is God himself, and our moral duties derive from the commands of a just and loving God. Um, now, what was your question before you got to the Euthyphro part? Um, how See, but what does that have to do with some of the certain laws, like sex before marriage, let's just say, sex before marriage is evil because God says it's evil, or homosexuality is evil because God says it's evil, where are the results? Where is the rationality and the reasoning? Because if God never said it was bad, then it wouldn't be degenerate, and there wouldn't be this degeneracy because God never said it was bad or degenerate, and there's no other reason for us to say it is. Without the results, it's only degenerate, because God said it's degenerate. There are no actual results to show degeneracy from these things. How can you be so sure oh, yes, about yes, yes. God's will? Well, I, I don't claim that I am so sure about these things, but in the case of the Canaanite uh, invasion, the question there was, is there an ethical theory that it would allow us to say that this command given by God in these narratives is consistent with an all-loving, and all good God. And what I attempted to do was to offer an ethical theory that would make that consistent. And it's not enough to just respond emotionally to this and get, get all upset. You've got to deal with the ethical theory that I offered and show that there would be an inconsistency between God's being all good and all loving and his issuing this command. Now, if I'm incorrect about that, then it seems to me that the Christian will have to say, well, I guess these narratives are not historical after all. He'd say, what you said Israel carried away by its nationalistic fervor thought that God had commanded it to do these things, but he, but he hadn't. But I'm not persuaded that we need to go that route yet. Uh, it seems to me that there is a defensible um, ethical theory that would enable us to say that God is perfectly loving, perfectly just. I think what you said is correct. You found, you found a way to find an ethical theory that makes those two apparently inconsistent things consistent. Okay, yeah, right. and I think, and I've had a lot of discussions on stage and off stage with various theologians whose job is to do just that, to find ways to resolve apparent inconsistencies, to find eth ethical solutions that validate their belief. But that is what's wrong, because the point of science and the reason it works is you don't just try and prove something you like to be true, you also try and prove it to be false. And that's what's really important. You don't just find yeah. a way to yeah. say the rainbows are caused by this or that. You actually try and see if your ideas are wrong and ask what's more plausible. And based on evidence and, and inquiry, what's more plausible? So what I find problematic is that the effort to find a rational excuse for something can work. But that doesn't make it right. Well, I think it's the same method that science uses, and you, you know this. Many times, a scientific theory will confront recalcitrant evidence, or there'll be shown some inconsistency, and the scientist doesn't just throw out his theory. He'll adjust certain auxiliary hypotheses in order to try to maintain consistency, and then he'll retest it but again. But the great thing is that he can also say, you know what, I was completely wrong. He could. And that if, if, doesn't happen in religion. If he can't. He can say he was wrong without having some complete inner disruption of your moral foundations and understanding of life and the afterlife. Mixing religion with science is biased because the religious side has too deep of an investment to admit they're wrong or to change and evolve and progress ideas and standards.
there's too deep of an investment and you literally it's actually contradictory because if you even try to do that you can't even associate with that religion anymore because it goes against those religious definitive laws concrete laws because god said so god said so there's no room for change or variability find a solution but you know the scientists like the theologian will not simply abandon his view when it confronts a difficulty or apparent inconsistency. He'll try to develop a consistent theory and account that would make sense of all the data. No, 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 it's not just that. He'll try and make predictions that work about uh, experiments that have not yet been performed. Sure. If science were, the difference between science and religion is science is just a story. If science just said, you know, I can explain, I can, I can explain something I've already seen and I can give a story that's consistent with that, well, then the tooth fairy would be work and, the, and, and, and leprechauns at the end of the rainbow or whatever. But what we try and do is we say, I've got my story has to make predictions that work on things I haven't yet tested, and I'm willing to throw it out if that theory doesn't work. Sure, and but that's he doesn't, the, that's he a doesn't throw difference. it out just because he confronts an inconsistency or recalcitrant in data. He will only throw it out when the efforts to develop a consistent account of the data fail. No, no, sorry. If I predict a ball is going to fall up and it falls down, I don't say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to reassess what I mean by up. Okay. No, but you, okay. you might well okay, reassess well, anyway. your theory of anyway, gravitation. I'm sorry. I, I, okay, oh, okay, okay. Well. I just want to make that point. All right. That's a really good point, though. That's a really good point. Can you speak to the role that Christians played, both in the Enlightenment and in the rise of democracy? Um, as a kind of appendix to that, thinking you specifically say of someone like William Wilberforce, who was instrumental in stopping the slave trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he explicitly did that on the basis of his deep mm-hmm. Christian convictions. I'm, I'm just wondering if you could sort of say a little something about that. Look, okay, I mean, it's a stereotype to suggest that people of faith are not good people. Of course, that's ridiculous. And just like it's a stereotype to say people of no faith are not good people, which unfortunately in certain parts of the world is a death sentence because of religion. Now, the point is, it is absolutely true and undeniable, and anyone who knows anything about history would be ridiculous to Just think about that. It's a death sentence to not believe in a certain religion. If you don't believe in my religion and, and my morals within this religion, then I should kill you. I'm going to break the morals of my religion to kill you for the greater of my religion. That's so fucked up. How does that even make sense? I want you to believe my morals, and because you don't, I'm going to break my morals. Say that in the Western world, at least, and I I, I disagree with Professor Dr. Craig about about the fact that there wasn't good science in the Islamic world or the Chinese world. There certainly was, but in the Western world, there's no doubt that there was an integral relationship between religion and and the development of science. As I said, Newton spent a lot more time writing about his wacko views on God than and, and alchemy than he did on, 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 on in the Precipia. But the point is, that we, well, first of all, we should, my first thing, statement is saying, thanks, did a good job, now go home. Okay, I mean, historically, if that led to the development of science, that's great, we should be thankful for that aspect of religion. But there's a good reason why there's an integral relationship. It was the only game in town. It was the only historical source of power. It was the National Science Foundation of this 15th century. Galileo and others had to, had to, had to have patrons who were popes and, and other people because it was the only source of education and, and, and power. So it's not too surprising that in a society in which science developed, the only source of education and power was religion. But that, but that, historical, that historical fact does not in any way uh, suggest that, that, there's any real, that there's anything more than his, the accident yeah. of history. Yeah, I've heard you give this response before. Yep, and that was my exact reasoning for why feminism yeah, grew with the power. occult. Because of all the power that religion had, women who didn't have power and weren't a part of the power so. in the church, <laughs> which had all the power, they had to go through the occult and the occult because of the french revolution and the enlightenment was growing in popularity and it allowed women to have a path to power and eventually the beginning of feminism and the feminist movement that doesn't mean that they grew together with true intention and especially not an intention of destroying and killing the church and gaining power over men and corrupting society like rachel says it is the other thing that history teaches us is there's, it's not too surprising that newton was religious and even darwin was religious because at that time 
as I say, the education of people was religious education. It is interesting that nowadays in the National Academy of Sciences, the most esteemed scientific body in the United States, and the same is true in Australia, that, that almost no, that over 90% of the people claim that they have no religious faith. The point is, it's fine to say, it's just like saying that people believed in the sun god way back when. It doesn't mean, you know, that, that was then, this is now. The fact that things have changed is the fact that science no. is very good. Yeah, that, that, that's irrelevant <laughs> to the conceptual foundations that need to be in place in order for science to exist. But I want to say something else about this silly poll number that's been thrown around. This is committing an elementary fallacy that social scientists know about. Namely, it's a, it's a, a post hoc, propter hoc fallacy, yeah. thinking because it's, it's after it, it's because of this. And I have here the study by uh, Elaine Eklund of Rice University conducted uh, between 2005-2008 on scientists at major first-rate research universities. And what she found was that scientists do not become irreligious as a result of their becoming scientists. Rather, and this is a quotation, their reasons for unbelief mirror the circumstances in which other Americans find themselves. They were not raised in a Christian home. They have had bad experiences with religion. They disapprove of God or see God as too changeable. The fact is these folks became unbelievers before they went into science. Their unbelief is not a result of their science. So these polls just are committing elementary fallacies. Well, uh, look, look, the point, the, the key point, is, well, there are two key points. First of all, what you've demonstrated is that when you... Th First of all, if you really want to go there, Christians and, and just, you know, religious people in general literally create their own private schools separate from, you know, their nation's public schools just to teach them their own versions of science or to just literally avoid being taught mainstream science, as Bill Nye calls it, you know, science. So it's just funny, like, how could you say that these Christians, I, I'm sure many of them, if they are Christian because they grew up in a Christian home and they didn't denounce it, many of them probably went to some kind of religious schooling, Catholic school or private school, and were taught Christian science. <laughs> which doesn't even, you can't, just an oxymoron. <laughs> so there's that first. So this is a stupid point to bring up. And secondly, I know myself, the more I started learning about science and just, you know, growing up and experience in life and stuff, it was harder and harder to cohabitate being a Christian and believing in science. I tried to make it work because leaving a religion that you're born into, uh, when you're leaving it, it feels like you're doing something wrong you're gonna to go to hell, you're betraying your family, all these things. So it's hard to do. You, you, you just, you know, if you think about it long enough, you get to the point where you can't cohabitate the two in your head anymore for them to make sense. And I guess you have to make the judgment yourself, which one makes the most sense to you, which one you believe in more, essentially, I guess, even though one has empirical evidence, empirical evidence, Empirical evidence. Empirical evidence. One has evidence and facts and proof and science to test it. The other doesn't so much. The other has faith. You don't need faith in, in science. <laughs> the, the whole point of science is to defeat faith or to prove. Like, like, you don't want to have faith in something. You want knowledge. You want truth. Thrust religion down the throats of children, which is child abuse, before they even before they even have a, 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 these are deep, you know, you're a, you're a man who spent most of your life studying the deep questions of theology. They're deep questions. They're not something, you know, you don't talk about libertarianism or conservative ideals to a three-year-old, but you force this down when there are three. You, you can scare them and tell them, if you don't do this, if you do this, you're going to go to hell. Do you know how scared I used to be for my Jewish friends at school thinking that when they died, they were going to live in an eternal pit of fire? and be tortured for the rest of their lives. <laughs> like, I'm like a five-year-old girl. I don't think it's that far of a stretch for him to say that, to be honest. Three-year-old, it's very, very diff difficult to, to abandon those things. It's very difficult for any of us who were brought up in a religious house to, to completely abandon those notions because when you're a child, you, you don't have the, the cognitive abilities, and in fact, you, you, you're, the, these things uh, just become dogma. But the other thing that you suggest, which somehow, 
this myth that, that, you, that is pervaded by both of you is that somehow there's this connection between religion and science. There isn't. Those, you know, there are groups that study religion and science and they talk to other groups that study religion and science. The point is that I have been a scientist for 30 years and I've never been, not once, to a scientific meeting, a scientific seminar, a scientific class where the word God has been mentioned. It's just irrelevant. As Steven Weinberg says, most scientists don't even think enough about God to know if they're atheists. Well, you remember the, you remember the quotation that I read from P.T. Landsberg uh, about the conference at which he spoke and the articles and the journals that I referred to. They're not, they're not, they're, the point is, what I like to say is the same thing I said to philosophers, some philosophers. Great, you guys study the intersection of religion and science, you work on it, and we'll go discover how the universe works. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we've, uh, um, we've got two last questions. Uh, and I think that's totally fair. I think that's totally fair. I think that's really cool if we start warping the idea of religion instead of thinking of these, you know, ancient scrolls and scripture and text and start thinking of religion, of the relationship between science and God, if there is one, and start really reevaluating that in a modern way that matches current science and, and takes in the um, variable of change. Just like, you know, they say the founding fathers took in the variable of change when making the constitution. Now, you know, there's debate about whether they actually did that or not, but that's what I think a great focus for modern day religion would be, is to really start thinking about the intersection of God, if there is one, and modern science, and the future. I think that's the only way you can take religion seriously today really i can't take it seriously the world was created in eight days and we came from adam and eve and we're gonna go to an eternal hell if we die and don't take in jesus christ and we're gonna go to an eternal afterlife if we do die and take the name of jesus christ or whatever i don't think that's reasonable and i think the only way you can take religion seriously today is taking in modern science, the variable for it to change in the future, and really just trying to comprehend these things in the best way we can, using science to do it. And I think that's a really interesting idea to have. Instead of hanging on to these old religions, there could be people who try to even incorporate the old religion, which I guess which is what the apologists are trying to do. But I don't know, and I tried to do it for a little bit, it just didn't work. So I just see it as that's their specific interpretation of God. And they came to this interpretation because of information that they were given, that they were raised in, um, and they were taught. That's something important too. I don't think you can be taught religion. I don't think it's right to try to teach somebody and tell somebody what the answer and what the truth is. I think that's something we individually experience. Maybe we can theorize about it, think about it, and come to our current conclusion, but it's not really a conclusion, it's just our current standing of it. And collectively, we can all talk about this and theorize and maybe get more answers. Science is a part of finding those answers. But if you just reject it, you're not gonna get anywhere and you're just stagnant. And I think that's a really disappointing outcome for religion, the answer, God. I just think that's kind of pointless. Yeah. When you say that you don't care about it, that's just an autobiographical comment about your personal psychological state. Fine, there are others who do care deeply about it. It's not a, uh, and it, including, it, I think, hundreds of people who will be coming to the Sydney event to talk about this very topic. Why is there something rather than nothing? But it's just nothing? a definition. It's a semantic definition. I describe an initial state. I don't care what you call it. That's semantics. Okay. The physics tells me the physical question is. Did those things exist? Did space, did time exist? And by the way, as I say, in fact, one of the many, you heard this during it, this was a William Craig bullshit meter. I hit it every time. He talked, about, he talked about science and got it wrong. The point is we don't have any evidence, absolutely, that the universe began. Even Alex Vilenkin in that paper said it began, probably. The point is there are the, 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 the very papers that, that, he's talk, that, that William Craig talked about, which I'm sure you don't understand because you don't understand general relativity, in fact, are based on general relativity, which we know breaks down as a quantum theory. And in fact, those presuppositions that there must be a singularity or a beginning, there are many theories like loop quantum gravity, some areas of string theory, uh, the ekperiodic universe, that in fact produce an eternal universe that contracts and expands forever and has been around forever. That is consistent with the known laws. 
we don't know the answer, and it, we're excited because we don't know the answer, because we've got something to learn. We didn't know the answer to the question before we asked it, like Dr. Craig did. I really appreciated what you said in your opening speech when you said you have no respect for distortion and misrepresentation. Yeah, because I, I don't call think me on it. anyone has misrepresented the notion of creation from nothing more than you have. In every case, you, you, and we'll talk about this in Sydney. You give me an example. I'd like to say that, you. give me an example. In every case, you are talking about a physical system changing from one state to another. You are not talking about uh, nothing in the sense that not anything. Now, in, in the case of the models, I you, define you, very you carefully what I talk about. The bohr guth vilenkin theorem doesn't even presume the, the gravitational equations of general relativity. It is it, it, independent it, it's, of them. And so it will. Let, let, you know, it, at the next talk, we'll, we'll discuss the physics of the next paper, okay? We'll discuss the physics of, of say, loop quantum gravity, which yeah, has a bound solution. I'd be ha I, I, actually. Or maybe I the echoic universe. If you will look, we'll discuss the statements that, in fact, say that I'm this theorem breaks it. down. I'm ready to do it. If you will look at the, author that I co or the article I co authored with James Sinclair, who I is did. a physicist, in the Blackwell Companion for Natural Theology, those very theories that you talk about, pre Big Bang cosmology, loop quantum gravity, those are all discussed in that article, and Vilenkin discusses them too, and they, they are not successful models of a past eternal universe. How do they, you know? They won't work. How do you know that? Because of the scientific articles that have been published on them, for example. What, what uh, about the scientific for, for, articles that have been published, in fact, that are, there, there are meetings on that talk about an eternal bounce universe? You think all those scientists uh, just happen to like it, and just, they, go to, they go to work and work on this because they have some inner belief that the universe is eternal, and they're actually, they don't mind that it's inconsistent mathematically? That's nonsense. No, they're, they're working on trying to find a model like that, but so far it hasn't We just been done. don't know the answer, and I wish you'd just understand that that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Not knowing the answer means there's something left to learn. <laughs> Certainty in the absence of, of, yes, of, but you, of you evidence deny. is in fact the source of much of the problems in when, the world. When somebody work. like Alex Vilenkin, who is one of the premier cosmologists of our friend. day, says all the evidence we have says that the universe has a beginning, that ought to make us pause and take that seriously. Now, that's not to say it's certain, but it is to say it's that consistent the evidence with our universe having a beginning. If scale. you ask me, if, if you ask me, what would I bet? I bet our universe had a beginning. You bet what? I bet our universe had a beginning, but I'm not certain of it. Well, and I know that I the physics. Hold on. That is my, that is my, based on what, uh, the, the physics that I know, I'd say it's a more likely possibility. Yeah, right. But it doesn't say the universe had a beginning. It says it's likely. That is a fundamental oh, difference that you Dr. don't understand. Krause, please, please, any <laughs> statement you make can be qualified with the pre prefix probably. Because qualifications are what science is all about. We qualify our uncertainty. That's, that's that silly. That is what makes science that's so silly. good. Okay. There's no okay. scientific article that contains the word probably in front of every sentence. No, that's, it doesn't say probably because it doesn't have to. That's the point of science. It's experimenting and learning. You would only be publishing it if you, if you understand that this is what you believe is probable or likely right now. But as a scientist, you understand that might be proven untrue eventually. Whereas in religion, you can't do that. You can't evolve with religion. You can't go back and say, oh, well, God was wrong about that.